It's time to accelerate. Hey friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 513 of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record where I hold in-depth conversations with today's leading experts in sales, marketing, and leadership six days a week. If you'd like to see the show notes for this episode, go to andypaul.com forward slash 513. 513, that's today's episode number. You'll find there we provide a detailed time-stamped breakdown of, of this and all conversations on Accelerate. So if there's something you missed while you're listening to the conversation, you want to go back and refer to it. You can check it out through convenient timestamps. So again, that's andypaul.com forward slash 513. Joining me on the show for the second time is Babette Tenhaken. Babette's the founder and president of Sales Aerobics for Engineers, which I think is such a great company name because I always have this vision of her leading a sales training class of engineers who are all wearing 1980s vintage leg warmers. But in any event, Babette reached out to me recently about an article I'd written about discovery and asking great questions. And it turned into a great back and forth through email exchange about how to do effective discovery call. So I suggest that we should continue that conversation here on Accelerate. So Babette's joining us again. Babette, my friend, welcome back to Accelerate. Oh, gosh. Thank you, Andy. I'm thrilled to be here again. So for those, yeah, I should say welcome back to Accelerate because you were here all the way back in episode 57, one of my early, Mm. early, early guests. Well, it was fun. It was fun then, and I'm looking forward to having some fun with you today to kick in the sales can around. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kicking the can or kicking the bucket, one of the two, right? So, <laughs> all right, not yet. So, not yet, right? Okay, here's a question for you. I've been starting the show with this question quite often recently. Is is in your mind, what's the biggest single challenge today facing sales reps? I think they don't take the time to discover the context of the issue and uh, to fully understand the context of that issue. And as a result, they end up proposing solutions that either will not uh, lack staying power or are inappropriate, quite honestly. So context, they they just don't have time for it. Yeah, which is sort of another word of saying sort of a lack of curiosity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, to me, curiosity is the hallmark of, of any process, any discovery process. And so uh, I don't know whether it is the way organizations, sales organizations are throwing a, a tsunami of information at reps or whether the leads uh, that are being sold to reps as being qualified are are coming loaded with information, but regardless, they're selling based on assumptions. And and so the discovery process, quite honestly, is really important for that sales rep to figure out how much of the information they've received prior to that sales call is actually valid. Uh, assumptions or, can really derail, it, valid or invalid, quite honestly, or, and go from there. And or important or unimportant, unimportant or unimportant. I mean, yes. I think, I think yeah. that's that's that. we had touched on this earlier. Is that oftentimes uh, one of the key problems? I think Jill Conrath talks about this. Is you know one of the big problems facing sales reps today is they're just overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. So absolutely. So you can sort of see if if you're being inundated with information, <laughs> and there's all sorts of things coming down the pike that are going to make this worse. You know, rep being inundated with information with good intent, but it's still, if you're really overwhelmed, then as you said, you're likely to take a lot of that information at face value rather than really ask a question that might really uncover what the customer is interested in. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And and as a result of uh, just relying on or just being overwhelmed by too much information during the discovery process, far too many sales folks end up actually convincing themselves, not the buyers, of what they're selling. So, you know, they, and they get on a roll and, and they get so excited that they're looking for, uh, they're trying to create verbal and visual cues to encourage themselves so they can feel good about moving potential buyers through the discovery process. And that's 
not really what's happening <laughs> at all. So, so I they end up I, I think wasting well the buyer's time for sure, and uh, they you know a lot of salespeople end up wondering what just happened when no sale results. So, yeah, I mean that's that's really this sort of an interesting interesting challenge because again if. If we have this, assume this is correct about reps feeling this overwhelm from, and you know they're giving they're being given a lot more tools, a lot more information about the prospects yeah. and the customers, and you know this is a persona, and we can sort of go down. You know this is the questions we should be asking based on this persona, yada 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 yada. So they have these sort of step by step scripted playbooks. Is but they, I guess they what you're saying is they really don't feel empowered to take the time to sort of step outside sort of that really defined process. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, you know, there's an art to selling. There's an art to anything. And it really has to deal with um, process and discipline. But it, it's similar, really, quite honestly, to, you know, you run distances and mm-hmm. um, and I sing opera. So, the thing is, is that the artistic interpretation means that you've got confidence in the core foundation of your training, but you're going to step outside the limits of it or step outside the limits or the boundaries of that sales script or the discovery questions you've been told that you're supposed to be asking. And take a look and take a listen and observe what are you really seeing from this potential customer? Does it really fit into anything? And just be curious. And, st- and that creates an organic conversation. And, and, you know, in my playbook, it's all about, to me, the best conversations you can have with customers are those conversations even they didn't know they wanted to have with you. Sure. Until you both started to have them. And those aren't scripted conversations at all. But they come from confidence in your training. Well, and this is the thing that I think is really sort of an interesting conundrum we face you know, mm-hmm. as, a, as a profession, as an industry, is that in sales, is that, yeah, we are, we are blessed with all this great technology and innovation that's happening in the tool side that, that enables reps to, to have a lot of this information and so on. And I was just reading something yesterday or talking to a company about their product, which was you know, providing all this insight and in what do the A players do so that you know the B and C players can copy what the A <laughs> players do. But you really brought up a key point, which exists, which you really can't you, know, you, you can't quantify, which is mm. what makes the A players different is they do step outside the bounds. Yeah. Yeah. So, they do. They, they so I, I can listen I can listen to a, chances. Right. They take artistic chances. I like that. I mean, I, I uh, have this expression one of my guests had used at one point about, you know, you, you can't, you, art can't be defined by an algorithm, mm-hmm. right? And, and that's sort of true about sales as well. Yeah. Is that the algorithm is only going to take you so far. And the thing that's oftentimes missing when you've got these, yeah, I can sit and listen to five recorded phone calls of A players, but, you know, I could even copy them word for word. And talk like them, but it's, I'm not going to get the same outcome. Exactly. Be- because, you know, you said there's that artistic component, stepping outside the bounds, stepping outside themselves, looking at the customer a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. That that's really, that's a behavior that's really important to incorporate that. And asking all the quote unquote right questions isn't going to save you if you don't sort of have that empowered to make a, to feel like you can make a difference. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I also feel that, you know, A players ask hard questions, you know, that help customers make hard calls. And I know that's my calling card. And and that's a choice. You either work with me or not. You you either do business with that salesperson or not. But I think most buyers, as skeptical as they are, want to do business with somebody who really keeps them on their toes and tells them what they need to know versus you know, kind of sells them some short, trying to sell them something based on what the customer is willing to hear. So uh, if you're if you're really focused on customer retention at the point of customer acquisition, then that's the type of relationship that you're trying to establish with your customers from the get-go. 
uh, a longer term one. If you're just trying to place a product or a solution so you can make your numbers and move on and not worry about customer retention, well, then, you know, you're you're still going to, you're not going to have artistic interpretation at all because, <laughs> you know, you're not right. going to involve risk. Right, right. All right. So, sir, finishing up on that part of the conversation then. So, if you could summarize and say one behavior that a seller should master in order to make a difference with regard to being curious and so on, what, what would that be? Relentless curiosity. So how do, you, how do you make that a behavior? By getting people to do their own homework, to do their own research and figure out the kind of stuff that they're interested in and Google articles quite honestly, about it. And so that they become rather comfortable and conversant with that type of subject matter. You know, they have their own opinions. And as a result, all of a sudden, they have this out-of-body experience with clients where a question comes out spontaneously based on curiosity. And they ask the client this really cool question and all of a sudden they're off and running and it's because they took the time to be curious and decide they're interested in certain things and they're on their way to becoming a subject matter expertise as a result yeah so to maybe expand on that just a little bit so what you're saying is that that to develop this curiosity is you need to be able to um do research and go learn beyond what the company provides you absolutely ab- about your products and your services and your customers that you serve and yeah take go the step beyond and yeah. develop your own opinions about it and i think this is that's really a critical thing you bring up is have opinions mm-hmm. yeah yeah absolutely i mean you know there are times um, when, you know, when I'm consulting that, you know, I have to really sit there and go, how appropriate is your product for your audience that you're selling it to? You know, let's backtrack a little bit here. You're so convinced, you know, and you're selling it a certain way, but the reality of the situation is it, it may be outdated or it may not be appropriate. Sure. And so, you know, sometimes, especially cause I deal with the industrial Internet of Things ecosystem. So the pace and cadence of, of tech advances in manufacturing and industrial environments, I, I, you talk about a tsunami. I mean, it's like light speed. And so quite honestly, sometimes the way people are selling and what they're selling doesn't fit that customer anymore. And, and somehow the bus has left and the ship has left the dock and you know, somehow the sales rep and the sales organization just hasn't gotten that email yet. And so, you know, to me, that's part of the discovery process. And if you're still trying to sell and you're not being curious about it to say, you know, I don't think that solution is going to work for you right now. Let me do some additional research because based on what we're saying, A, B, C, and D seem to be relevant right now. Right. You know, that's a different, co- that's, that's an A-level conversation. That's, you know, and that's a C-suite level conversation. Well, I'd written something recently that you, you reached out to me about and mm. that sort of was the genesis of this particular conversation and is one of my weekly newsletters. And, uh, it was a quote from Jonas Salk, who is the great scientific mind in American history that, uh, you know, discovered and developed the first effective vaccine for polio. Uh, which was, you know, lifesaver for tens of thousands of, of people in this country, if not more. And his quote was, is that the moment of discovery is really the discovery of the question. And what was it about that, that, that uh, before I explain why I liked it, <laughs> tell, me what, <laughs> tell me, tell me why that attracted your attention. Well, and, and, and folks, I immediately sent Andy an email. I just said, this is brilliant. And it, it's so timely. Because what I've discovered um, is that in working with salespeople, when they think they've discovered the question that that needs the solution and the answer, they stop the sales process short. And I'm a scientist by training. And, and you know, Andy, you, you, have te- you know, you're a technical uh, professional by training. And that's where they stop the sales process. However, in science, that's the question where that's the foundation of the type of question that they need to to start asking. There's a question in back of that question that they've just spent a lot of time discovering. 
and determining that question has to do with context. Right. What is the context? And I have a saying, I always say root causes have really big contexts. And without taking the time to discover the context of the buyer's question, sellers will propose inappropriate solutions and they'll end up selling themselves short. Which so what, ha- we, what was your take? <laughs> yeah. So what was your take on your brilliant? <laughs> on the, on Jonas, Jonas Locke's brilliant uh, quote? Well, and for me, it's, it's been one of those quotes you know, I always sort of keep around and keep referring to and, and refer mm. lots of people to cause, because to me, it speaks to never being satisfied. You know, yes. you start talking about the relentless curiosity, but you know, the moment you th- you're satisfied with what you think you found out, to your point precisely, you stop selling. And then mm. the sales process is sort of frozen in time. And, you know, there are certain, certain things you're doing, like code development otherwise, where, you know, it's really important to freeze the code at a certain moment in time. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you're working with the customer, it's, it's not that first aha moment that's really the aha moment. It's mm-hmm. really, that's really the start. Yeah. And so this idea of self-satisfaction or thinking that you've done it, you know, you've discovered what their, their pain, quote unquote, pain point was. Yeah, not so much. And so it's really, you have to think about the fact that you're, you're doing discovery throughout the entire sales process. You know, we tend to sell it short by saying, yeah, well, this is, you know, the second phase of our sales process and we have certain exit criteria and you meet those. So on discovery, great, you're going to go on to the next phase. But there really is a discovery component in every step of the sales process. And the moment you stop is your odds of winning the deal go down pretty dramatically. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a, an archaeology, quite honestly, to it. <clears throat> I mean, a lot of times, and you and I too, for example, I'll get a lot of calls and requests for executive coaching, you know, and, mm-hmm. and it I, I deal with complex business sales and technical environments within the industrial internet of things ecosystem. So they either make stuff, process stuff, or automate processes. But depending on who I'm speaking with and their professional discipline, we discover why they would like that coaching. And often they, what they call or what they assume they want isn't really what they need. So how many sellers would go close the deal since we've got a buyer, right, that's gung-ho for coaching? But often um, you end up proposing the wrong solution. So in my case, often there's a non-disclosure agreement. It's mm-hmm. signed. Information's exchanged. It allows mm-hmm. me to establish why they need coaching. And often what they feel the coaching has, is about is, is sales philosophy, is customer acquisition, customer success, and customer retention. However, I don't stop there at their question. That's not my aha. And, and most, and you know, how many people would be jumping up and down and go, ooh, 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 <laughs> let me send you a proposal mm-hmm, and sign mm-hmm. on the dotted line. Mm-hmm. Yes, they have a problem, and I certainly do have a solution for their problem. However, they're making assumptions that their problem has to do with inability to close complex sales after demos, for example. So if I propose a coaching program for their definition of the problem, that, aha, they'll have the same problem again and again. Right. And why is that? Because during the discovery process, as well as in reading the information they send me and in subsequent conversations... I discover the real question that they are not asking themselves. And that's when you start to have those conversations that even they didn't realize they wanted to have with you until you start having them. And, and, and that's quite honestly where we sell the value of our solutions, whether it's coaching or what, you know, whatever we're doing or our software or whatever, because we took the time to discover the real question behind the question that they were asking and, and behind the questions we're asking them. Uh, it makes all the difference in the world It's an uh, the, is to discover the unasked question. Yeah, and I think one of the issues that we're confronting is the one that we talked about up front of the show is that, that you know, the reps are feeling pushed mm-hmm. to have a certain quote-unquote velocity on their deals and their pipeline that necessarily push them past this point, right? They they get that, what they think is that aha moment. And yeah, I've got it. I've got the nailed. I really understand what the buyer wants. This, hey, we're full speed ahead at this point in time. 
but they're really not. And it, it and this is, I think, what A players do differently is that they step outside the process, as we talked about before. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of interesting. It's almost like a chicken egg situation because I was talking to one sales leader about this a couple of weeks ago. Is is they were saying, well, okay, how do you how do you coach the B players who are feeling more insecure about their status and more pressured because they aren't performing at the same level to have that confidence to step outside the process to ask that other question other than saying, yeah, instead of saying, yeah, okay, great, check that box. We identified the pain points. You know, we fulfilled our exit criteria for that stage. Let's go to the next stage. I think I think part of the problem in that scenario is that B players are reluctant to think further than the close of the initial sale, the initial acquisition of the customer. And in my playbook, customer retention starts at customer acquisition. So they think they get to ask the customer retention question sometime later. And there may be no later. (laughs) And so, so with the B players, first of all, what do they have to lose? You know, if they're, if they're not closing sales anyway, take a chance. Okay, be curious and start digging a little bit further into this. And with certain, because there are, you know, inevitably there are certain customers that they're going to feel more comfortable having a bit more of an organic uh, conversation with and try out those questions behind the questions and stop you know, sounding like everybody else and just be yourself. I mean, have some sales common sense there. And if you can, if you can really give some of these B players, some of the latitude, it really kind of expands their abilities to close sales. You know, whether they're going to be a players or not is, is one thing, but I have found that since the majority of the sales force tends to be these B players, what does expanding their entire revenue generation capability by 10% look like? It can have a bigger, bigger uh, impact uh, on on your sales organization um, if if sales managers weren't playing off with their head uh, so frequently. So um, I, I think there are some real pearls. In the B, uh, the B players, uh, but often their skills, you know, I, I think it's up, it's up to uh, the sales managers to discover uh, the the skills behind the skills uh, as well, uh, because they, they they may have a technical understanding and comprehension that some of the some of the other B players don't have. There are certain you know B plus players, for example, that I think are able, you know, are, are quite honestly, quite immensely coachable to really move out of um, the rut that they get themselves into. Yeah. Well, I think that that's, this is really a critical issue is, is that the B players, to me, the line between A and B is pretty small, pretty, mm. pretty thin. And that my experience has shown me in working with you know, hundreds of companies and thousands of sales reps and so on is that Yeah, it's this idea of being able to be themselves, right? I mean, if they can really stop, Mm -hmm. instead of stop trying to be someone else, which is the way we sort of conduct our training these days, increasingly now, we're seeing some of the tools that come out as, yeah, we can can model the behaviors of A and we can capture them, you know, hey, in these phone calls and these interactions and this playbook, you know, be like them. And the answer is not to be like them. The answer is to be the best version of yourself and take from them what you can use yourself. And, you know, we're not, we don't want to create cookie cutter versions of, of our A players. Cause that's just not impossible. That's impossible. It just won't work. And, but we seem to be sort of in this trend. We're trying to make everybody sort of the same because we are able now to, to through technologies capture what, what the A players are doing without a lot of context, unfortunately to it. But at least on the surface, but we need to we need to have the B players feel empowered and enabled to put their personal spin on it. Well, and I think part of the thing with with A players, and it goes back to relentless curiosity, is A players bring in everybody into the sales process, and B players don't. And so, if you're trying to acquire a customer, and you're really thinking about acquiring them in a manner that keeps their business for a long time, 
who else is important to the process and not just to close the sale. So the people that you don't want to talk to most of the time because you don't understand what they're saying, your sales engineers. A lot of times, B players bring them in as needed. They apply as needed. The A players are talking to them from the get-go. Hey, mm-hmm. I've got this lead. What do you think? You mm-hmm. know. So, I mean, I always have have my sales engineers that I love to work with, and and we were so on the same page. But we were curious about what each other did. The customer service people, the customer account managers. It's like you have to really kind of understand your own internal ecosystem. If you're really going to offer a solid case uh, to your, you know, to a new customer, or you're going to expand business with your existing customers, and I do feel that B players are so focused on on the the discovery process or selling or whatever it is, you know, because I think quite honestly their managers are hammering on them because they're not making their numbers, that they don't take time to sit back and take a look at what are the internal resources that exist in their own company that they're not utilizing. There are real life people there who are expert at this stuff. I mean, even I would talk, I talk to people in the loading dock. Sure. You really, you really want to know what's finding, uh, you know, going on and and talk to the administrator sits at the front door and talk to the guy at the loading dock. So there's a ton of stuff and it's that type of discovery that they're not doing. Yeah. And I, I, Absolutely, I agree. And so there's two elements of that. One is they have to have the initiative and go do that, right? They have to be mm. strategic in terms of how they're looking at, at their own account acquisition in terms of strategic, strategic internally. Absolutely. The second part, though, too, is managers have, who are listening to this, you need to be careful because oftentimes what you're doing is you're telling those internal resources, don't spend time with the B players, right? If you're, mm-hmm. if you're, if you're, being, if you're a sales engineer and you're getting too many requests from sales, well, prioritize them, right? Start with the A players and go down to the B. And they, we get this sort of self-reinforcing vicious cycle that happens where you know, the B and C players are starved for resources yep. because when they go to contend for them, basically they're being told, yeah, they don't exist. I have to prioritize these other people first. And so managers, you might be doing this unconsciously, but it does happen. And I see it in company after company after company is you really need to level the playing field for everybody. And to your point that you made by bad is, is train. If you have to train the B players about how to do this internal form of selling to gather the resources they need to help close deals. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree because otherwise if, if the managers are just saying to the B players, copy what the A players are doing, well, what are the A players doing? They've got a lot of, let's say, you know, with the complex selling, they've got a lot of demos. So the next thing you know, B players are dialing up a demo because that's the behavior they're trying to emulate, but they don't understand all the homework, all the work that led up to the that demo with the, you know the A players right. getting the right. demo and as a result the sales engineers I mean engineering department sales engineers are just inundated and there's just not enough hours in the day and of course then they they get into a call and all of a sudden they got to sell instead of demo and so yeah it's it's that whole thing and it's it's self defeating so just you know th- this this management style of just sell like so and so so like and your bad bad and you'll be fine it, it that just doesn't work because everybody's unique and it, they've got a unique spin on it but and also as a result uh, again their curiosity just goes out the door and it's not fun <laughs> and so i do think that the sales process there has to be an element of enjoyment in what you're doing um, because that shows too with the customers Oh, absolutely. And I think it's a great, a great point for us to end on this is that this idea is curiosity is fun, mm. right? I mean, part of the, yeah. the biggest part of, of selling that's fun is, you know, A, you get to meet interesting people, connect with them, but it's this idea of being curious and learning about them mm-hmm. that is the fun. And yeah. yeah, if you're just in robotic lockstep trying to execute a certain process and you're not you're not personalizing this experience for the prospect or for yourself, it's not going to be fun and you're not going to do a good job. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. All right. Well, I bet as always, fantastic to talk with you. So I want to thank you for being on the show again. Tell people how they can connect with you and find out more about you. 
Great. You can connect with me via my website or LinkedIn. Uh, I spell my name B-A-B-E-T-T-E. T-E-N-H-A-K-E-N dot com. And I am the author of the Sales Aerobics for Engineers blog as well. If you want to discuss this eternal dialectic between technical and non-technical <laughs> people and you want some collaboration hacks. So welcome. You can contact me by email, Skype, telephone, and let's just continue the conversation. All right. Bye, Beth. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, yeah, friends, thank you for spending this time with us today. Remember, come back, join us again tomorrow. Another episode, another great interview with another great guest. In the meantime, if you have a chance, you're listening to this uh, podcast on one of your iPhone, <laughs> an app on your phone, take a second before you hang up and go away. Uh, subscribe to this, uh, this podcast, leave a review. We really want to hear what you have to say. So thanks again for joining me. And until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. 